to get into muscle physiology in the segment that's going to cause the most stress, which is sliding filament model. Okay? So we're going to kind of get through some of the introductory stuff here, which is pretty mellow. And then on Monday, we're going to start cranking. And then Wednesday, we'll get full stride. And I really would like for you to read for next week chapter 12 specifically on the sliding filament model, okay? If you're not going to read the whole thing, because your quiz on Sunday is over chapters 9 and 11. So I know it's a tall order to ask you to read 12 by Monday, but if you can look at the section on sliding filament model, you'll be a little bit more oriented as we get into it next week. And if there's two main topics, I'm sorry, I, did, do you have a question? You could do quiz 12 this weekend. Yeah, it's, it's open. Yeah, they're all open. You can do it ahead of time. Not a problem. I mean, if you want to you know, binge three quizzes this weekend, go for it so you don't forget. Okay? But quiz, quiz 12 is not due until um, the 16th. Okay? So muscle fizz. <clears throat> Half the body's weight is made up in muscles. There's all, over 600 muscles in our body. Most of these are found in pairs. You, you've covered this pretty extensively in lab already. And I know this week you're in brain, and you're doing the dissection. But again, that should be somewhat fun. You know, you're doing a dissection, and, and, and you've already had a lot of the lecture physiology on central nervous system. And so the brain dissection should be kind of interesting for you. Muscle physiology, we're going back to some of your information from earlier in the uh, semester when we talked about muscles in lab. But it was really more ac action, um, maybe insertion, origin, uh, function. Here we're going to get into the physiology. Okay? You know that they're mostly found in pairs because you have bilateral sets of muscles. Right? The muscle group that exists on the right side typically exists on the left side of the body. So these skeletal muscles, they're voluntary, and they require conscious stimulation for the most part. Now, what about reflexes, Keller? Well, reflexes are a unique category that we went over, right? And that's a reflex arc. If it's a somatic reflex arc, you could tell me all about it. If it's an autonomic reflex arc. You could tell me all about it. You could give me examples like maturition and baroreceptor as examples that we, discuss, we discussed in class, in lecture, that are autonomic um, reflexes. But if you exclude reflexes, muscles are under voluntary contraction. They're functions, four functions of muscle. All right, this would be a very easy test question. And I don't write a lot of these styles of questions, but Here's A, B, C, D, right? <laughs> or I put one that doesn't fit, which is E, and I tell you which is not a function of muscle. What do they do? Obvious movement. Locomotion is another word for it. Stability, maintaining our posture. Whether you're sitting in your seat, standing upright, whether you're seated on the ground, moved to a standing position, Posture and local motion. If you're a, f a future physical therapist, you'll be dealing in these two categories about 90% of your work is movement for your patients and stability. Now, the two others, they control body openings and passages, like around the mouth, the eye, the GI tract, the urethra, and the anus. And they also generate heat. About 85% of our body heat is due to muscle movement and muscle contraction. And we'll talk next week about like the, a shiver response, right? Why do you shiver when you're cold, right? It's your body's way of firing muscles where you've got two proteins that are sliding across each other. You have actin and myosin, and that's what I want you to read about over the weekend, just so you are ready for it on Monday. And as they move across each other, you have friction, just like if I slide across this desk, right? The Mr. Miyagi technique. 
You just move things across each other, you generate friction, and you generate heat. So we have a lot of heat generation that's coming out of our muscles and just their normal activity. No, these are body openings. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, so if you're looking at, like, the mouth, yeah, but as far as um, uh, digestion, that's all smooth muscle enteric um, uh, nervous system control. You're absolutely correct. So, so the, the idea here would be talking about, like, the obicularis oris, okay, the bucinator, the masseter. Uh, so that controls the, you know, the opening of the, of the mouth. But um, this might be a little confusing, so that's a good footnote. Maybe I'll make some adjustments there. To move food peristalically through the GI tract is under smooth muscle peristalsis under enteric uh, nervous system. It's a very good point. Okay? This is not to be confused with that. That is linking it to really um, the mouth. Okay, <clears throat> all skeletal muscles will cross at least one joint. They're designed this way. So if you pull across a joint, you contract across a joint, you get movement. You either extend or you shorten the joint space, right? The angle of the joint either gets bigger or it gets smaller because you're contracting across that hinge point. Um, <clears throat> We have two attachment points. We have the origin that does not move during contraction, and we have the insertion that does move during the contraction. Now, oftentimes these can flip-flop depending upon the way you're describing the muscle. Okay? So origin doesn't move. Insertion is the one that moves, okay? depending upon the exercise or the activity. Each muscle has at least one action. Many have multiple actions. And the muscle contraction on a typical movement that you're describing is where the insertion is going to move closer to the origin because the origin stays stationary. Now, you can flip the exercise and have it go the opposite direction. So these are just nomenclature. Again, we make up the nomenclature. Innervations. These are nerves that control a muscle. And this is where our last unit is going to actually translate into this unit. You cannot get skeletal muscle contraction without a nerve firing. And we'll look at some disorders like muscle, uh, Duchenne's muscle, uh, muscle, muscle dis, uh, muscular dystrophy. We'll look at some others that there are challenges associated with this connection or this innervation between nerve to muscle. We'll look at flaccid paralysis next week. But this is the reason that architecturally, I like to have nerve physiology first, followed by muscle physiology. Okay? And then we finish up the semester with special senses, which is one of the most straightforward parts of the semester is unit five. Okay? We're talking about sight, smell, hearing, uh, balance, very straightforward. And it, it, it's what you're going to do in lab um, in two weeks. A couple of definitions, prime mover, synergist, and antagonists. The prime mover is the muscle that's responsible for the main movement. So the biceps brachii is flexing at the elbow, the prime mover. Synergists would be like, the brachioradialis, synergists that assist the prime mover. Same action, just a different muscle group. It's a backup muscle. It assists. It allows you to not fatigue as quickly. And then antagonists like quadriceps versus hamstrings group, the quadriceps are on the front of the thigh and the hamstrings are on the back of the thigh and they're antagonistic groups of muscles where they oppose each other. And they oppose each other for good reason, right? So here's our forearm flexion. Biceps brachii would be our prime mover. Our synergist in this example that we have is the brachialis. And the antagonist is the triceps brachii. We could have substituted other synergists here like brachioradialis, but 
This just gives you an idea of triceps will extend the elbow and biceps brachii will flex the elbow. So just terminology that's important for us to be keeping in, um, in mind. So we're just going to dive into a little bit of this section on cell anatomy. So as you read about the sliding filament model, you'll be able to appreciate what some of the characters are um, because we've actually touched on it a little bit. So this is the part of the lecture where I say, hey, do you remember a figure that kind of looks like this? They came from other units. Tell me what were some of those tissues? Yep. Yeah, so the nerve fascicle image in cross-section, as well as bone in cross-section. And I kind of told you it was coming, right? So this is the slide that I kept talking about. So way down here, we have an individual muscle fiber. That individual muscle fiber is synonymous with a muscle cell. So you should write on here, muscle fiber equals muscle cell. Because that's the first thing that confuses students. They're like, I don't understand what this muscle fiber is, Keller. I'm so confused about this fiber. Well, it's a muscle cell. Oh, well, why didn't you just say that? Well, I think I did, but maybe you missed it. It has a nucleus. <clears throat> it has internal parts. The internal parts of the muscle cell or the muscle fiber is what I want you to read about. You're going to see proteins that are cytoskeletal proteins. Back to unit one, you're going to have actin. It's a cytoskeletal protein. It creates the architecture of a cell. It's like the framework. It's like the trusses. In a muscle fiber, otherwise known as a muscle cell, the internal architecture is organized very specifically for a specific function that we need to talk about next week. And we want those internal proteins to slide across each other. Well, you, you package this with an endomycium. You put a bunch of them together with a perimycium. This is a muscle fascicle. We actually looked at nerve fascicles in the last unit. Very, very similar architecture. Now, if you look at a cross-section of skeletal muscle, this one happens to be one that's in your quadriceps group that's uh, inserting or originating um, at the level of the femoral uh, head. And this skeletal muscle in cross-section, you see this box, we've got all these different fascicles that make up that muscle belly. And all of this organization at the muscle fiber level or the muscle cell inside is all organized in the same direction. So when this slides here, it slides the entire muscle group. Everybody's working together to get muscle contraction. These muscles are excitable. This actually is really important because um, if a nerve is going to innervate them, you want them to respond to the electricity. They can conduct the signal. They can contract, and that's the sliding filament model that we're going to look at. They're extensible. They can come back to their resting position. You don't want to be like one and done, like, oh, I fired my uh, biceps brachii like 12 years ago, and you know I'm waiting to use this one for a really important moment. Okay, That would suck. So you want them to be extensible. They're elastic because the activities that we subject them to vary. And so you want them to be flexible and be able to stretch. This is where we're going to pause. And you'll see a figure like this in your textbook. And then you're going to dive into the inside of the muscle cell. And this is the stuff that I want you to take a look at before Monday. Okay? the inside of the muscle fiber, just the way it's organized. Have a great weekend. Do not forget quizzes 9 and 11. And if you're an overachiever, you can do 12. Okay?